time some new conflict comes up and I see new people that haven't seen the history of the movement act like it's the biggest new, oh my goodness, this is a giant split in the movement. What is happening? What is going on? Like, they're not part of the movement. We need to kick them out. Or, you know, unity, unity, unity. Like, it's the same thing over and over and over. Whew. Honestly, I have debated for a while whether or not I even wanted to make this video and it keeps kind of going through my head and I keep thinking about this topic and what exactly I want to say about it. And so I decided to go ahead. Uh, I've already tried multiple times to film this actually. Anyway, here I am. And basically I want to address this whole thing about the animal rights group Anonymous for the Voiceless or AV. What I want to talk about is how we deal with both problematic, toxic figures and leaders in the vegan and animal rights movement, how we deal with disagreements and ideological differences, and basically when is it worth talking about and discussing and publicly, you know, sort of airing our dirty laundry, as some people like to say. And when is unity and sort of sweeping things under the rug more important? One of the things that I have noticed over the years, and I, for those of you that don't know, I have been vegan since birth, participating in the vegan and animal rights movement and activism for pretty much my entire life. The first vegan conference I attended when, was when I was about one year old. Some people might call me more on the fringe of the, you know, so-called abolitionist or radical animal rights side of things. I'm vegan and I fundamentally care most about not harming and exploiting others. So yes, I talk about animal rights and I want to end all of animal exploitation. I am not just concerned with factory farming, which is what some of the historically, you know, animal welfare or the more middle of the road mainstream groups have spent a lot of time talking about. Anyway, basically, I just want to put that out there because I am absolutely no stranger to, to disagreements, to being considered radical or fringe or not part of what is seen as mainstream. And what I have found over the years, practically no matter what the issue is that someone is bringing up, whether it is critiquing a tactic, whether it is, you know, totally disagreeing with someone's approach, whether it is calling out a figure as problematic or part of the hashtag me too AR, no matter what it is, Almost any time anyone, a vegan or animal rights activist, criticizes another vegan, another animal rights activist, or critiques a group, you can expect calls of don't air our dirty laundry and but unity. We need to be a unified movement. This is what the animal abusers want. This is what the animal agriculture industry wants, right? They want us divided. They want us, you know, infighting and criticizing each other. And so you're playing into their hands. And I think there is a bit of truth to that. I do. That said, I also think we have to be incredibly careful about sweeping concerns under the rug and silencing very legitimate issues in the name of unity. I have worked with a number of different organizations, groups, people, activists, you name it. And in the more, you know, so-called abolitionist communities, and I, I have no, I don't feel like naming names, I don't think that's important here, but in some of the more abolitionist circles, there can be incredibly high standards of, you know, these just black and white lines drawn of, if you support this, if you think this, if you say this or do this, you're not abolitionist abolitionist enough. You are not radical enough. You are not good enough. You're not a real animal rights activist. You are not a real vegan activist. You are not part of that movement. Sort of gatekeeping about who and what is and isn't uh, a true activist or a true vegan. And some of that I at the time very much agreed with. I have been, I, I'm not gonna lie, I have been that gatekeeper. I have been one of the most critical people I know, particularly when it comes to the early 
uh, animal welfare versus animal rights sort of split that was happening in the early, you know, early to mid 2000s. And some of the most important influences in my life, activists and people I have worked with and really respect, have sort of really shaped me over time. And yet, after sort of spending a lot of time in these extremely critical uh, positions, I honestly started to not feel great about some of the behavior that I was seeing. And there's a level of sort of um, guilt by association, I guess is what I'd call it, that I have seen in some of these circles where even if you aren't saying or doing these things, if you are friends with or you share a post by an organization or a person that does or supports these things, then you are guilty by association and therefore you are not good enough, you are not radical enough, you are not abolitionist enough, and whatever other labels you want to throw out there. So over the last, I'd say, four years in particular, I have sort of wanted to become less critical and have worked to embrace a wider variety of tactics and perspectives and see the good in what people are doing. That said, I still hold many of those personal opinions and views that I still did. So what does this mean when it comes to the current controversy going on with the group Anonymous or the Voiceless? What does this mean when it comes to the, you know, influencer movement of activists that sometimes get called, you know, white saviors or male saviors. And, and, and what does this mean when we're talking about, you know, differences in ideology? And so the first thing I want to distinguish here and where I sort of fall on this today is if you are strictly talking about a difference in tactics and ideology, these, these are issues like, should we use graphic footage? Is this appropriate or not? Is this effective or not? Should we be doing, you know, door-to-door -door outreach? Should we be doing cooking demos? Is focusing on food really going to help achieve animal liberation? Are, um, you know, sh how should and how we be doing direct action, disruptions, any of these types of tactical differences and people can have really, really strong feelings on all sides of what is effective and what is beneficial for the animals and what is, you know, really best here. And when it comes to things like these, my take at this point is let's have those discussions. Let's have them, you know, maybe publicly, sure, but those seem like better within the movement things. So discussions that we should be having at vegan conferences, at animal rights conferences, that activists should convene to discuss this, you know, whether or not we should be doing certain things in the direction we want to take. That's, that's a little bit more of a, I think we do all share the same vision and we are all working for the same mission when we're discussing and debating things like this. It's then just a question of what is most effective and what is really best. And honestly, at this point, I no longer feel like, and I, I did at times, but I no longer feel like there is one right or best way to do activism. And while we can debate and discuss this all we want, and there are really good points to be made on a lot of different sides, my personal take is I don't want to be that gatekeeper anymore. And different things are, you know, different things call different people. So while I consider myself an educator and I don't really do things like circus protests because that doesn't feel like a useful or, or effective, you know, use of my time, other people, they might not be so good at talking to people. They might be more introverted. They might do much better holding a sign. And it's really hard to sort of discount the differences in individuals and individual personalities and strengths and weaknesses. And therefore, I don't feel right saying, this is the one way to do activism. We all have to do this. Everyone has to do this to be effective. Rather, I encourage and I think everyone should do what they feel called to do and what their skills really 
allow them. Some people that means, you know, writing, or some people that is just cooking food and showing their friends how good it looks. All of these things, I think, will help us achieve animal liberation and will help us achieve a vegan world. And so, you know, that is where we're all on the same page. Where we are not on the same page, and I stand by this one, is when it comes to, say, differences between animal welfare and animal rights. If you are not against animal exploitation, and you see nothing wrong with abusing, with using and exploiting animals as long as they are treated well, if your only goal is to work against factory farming, and that you see no problem with a few small humane farmers occasionally, then I will call you out on that. And I do not think that makes us on the same team or working for the same mission. Because we, although some of our interests and, and, and missions might overlap, and maybe we can find ways where we can work together there, our end goals are fundamentally different. And we are fundamentally working to achieve very different things. So that is, that's, I guess, point number one, right? If it's an ideological disagreement, but we're both clearly trying to, uh, to achieve the same endpoint, that's a discussion to be had and, and an important one. And we also probably wanna make sure that we're unified. So I, for example, while I pick and choose the activism I wanna do and support, I am no longer doing my, I'm doing my best to no longer openly criticize every other approach that's not my approach, as long as they are fully working towards the stated goal of animal liberation. Now, of course, where this really gets tricky is when people feel like someone's tactics or approach are actively undermining or preventing, you know, they're, they're actively undermining the movement. And that, that is how I view some of the collaboration with animal welfare and anti-factory farming work that has actually undermined authentic veganism. But uh, I've heard this when it comes to the group Direct Action Everywhere, right? Their tactics, their radical approaches. I've heard it when it comes to PETA what they, you know, they make vegans look bad and too radical in the media, like all of these sorts of things. Um, million dollar vegan campaign last year because it was seeking to reach Donald Trump, you know, a lot of people felt like that was extremely problematic. And then we had the uh, AR Me Too. And this is where several multiple uh, male figures and leaders in animal rights and animal welfare organizations were called out for sexual assault, sexual harassment, and a series of other allegations. I'm not really here to say that I have an answer to, you know, the controversies around recent influencer figures and, you know, anonymous for the voiceless, but I will tell you what I told a friend who was asking me when anonymous for the voiceless came out as and had some of their anti-intersectional, anti-social justice, human rights uh, approaches. And they were sort of wondering whether or not they should still participate in cubes. I basically told them my approach, which is that to me, there's a difference between, you know, for example, I personally do not like to do stuff with PETA. In case you hadn't picked that up, I am not their biggest fan. However, if I'm going to a protest or an event that someone else has organized and there are people that have PETA signs there or PETA is somehow involved, I'm not going to sort of use that guilt by association that I didn't like used on myself. And I'm not gonna not participate or not go to that event just because PETA is there or PETA signs are there. At one point, I may have done that. That's just not where my heart is at at this point and it doesn't feel that productive or helpful anymore. So, and, and I think this is true when it comes to sharing things online, right? Like you can disagree with an organization, you can disagree with a person on some topics or some issues and still think that they are doing good work in other areas or really like one particular thing or area they work in. And 
while I do still have some biases in me, there are certain organizations that I basically never share things from because of just everything that I know and, and dislike about some of these groups. But in other areas, I'm sort of trying to remember that I can disagree with a lot of what they do and still like some things they do and want to share that or want to support that. And I think that's true for people too, especially in the incredibly polarized climate that we are in right now, where I'm seeing vegan activists that are taking certain positions on things related to coronavirus and being outcast or criticized and people saying they won't trust or believe anything they share now. And we can, I just think it's really important to remember that people are really complex and, and a lot more holistic than this simplistic view. And so even if I disagree with someone or something they're sharing on one particular issue, I can still appreciate other wonderful things they've done and support and share that. And so this is my message to all of you. If you are wondering how to deal with these controversies, one, I think it's important that we don't shut them down because in situations like having really toxic, narcissistic individuals leading organizations that maybe really shouldn't be, we should be able to call out that problematic behavior. When we have um, male leaders that have sexual uh, misconduct allegations against them repeatedly for years and stories about the frat bro-like culture and toxic culture for women at some large um, vegan and, and uh, more animal welfare, but some animal rights organizations as well, that is extremely important that we don't sweep these under the rug. And I do think this idea of unity above all else, unity being more important than anything else in our movement or airing our dirty laundry or these disagreements has actually helped keep toxic, harmful people in power taking our movement in directions that aren't good for too long. So I want to make that really clear. We shouldn't shut every conversation down with claims of unity. The ones that I think it's worth sort of keeping more private or having within the movement are when it really is just over differences in tactics and approaches. When it is about toxic, harmful figures and you know, who am I to say which is which? Sometimes it's unclear. But when it is over these legitimate concerns and issues, those have to be addressed and they have to be aired. And that doesn't mean we are fracturing the movement or, you know, like it's falling apart. And this is, I know, a very different video, but it's something that I really felt called to speak to with my years of watching different conflicts. And every time some new conflict comes up and I see new people that haven't seen the history of the movement act like it's the biggest new, oh my goodness, this is a giant split in the movement. What is happening? What is going on? Like they're not part of the movement. We need to kick them out or, you know, unity, unity, unity. Like it's the same thing over and over and over. And so especially for those of you that maybe are newer vegans or newer to this movement, I just want to tell you, don't, maybe also don't get too worked up over this because it seems like every time one of these come up, everyone thinks it's like the biggest issue the movement has ever faced and the end of the world. When in reality, it's like every, every few months now sometimes, and, and certainly every few years, there has been something that has seemed like the biggest split conflict and disagreement to different people. And one final note, this is also not unique to the vegan and animal rights movements, uh, especially when it comes to other social justice causes and, and in particular the women's rights movement. So I read this really fascinating book, I unfortunately do not remember the name of it right now, but it was all about the history of the women's rights movement in America. And one of the things that I had not appreciated until I read this book is that there was actually a major split in the women's rights movement between the NWSA and the AWSA, two of the major women's rights uh, organizations in the 1800s. The National Women's Suffrage Association, that's the NWSA, and the American Women's Suffrage Association, which was the AWSA. 
And the split, interestingly, the, the people that we often remember and that we teach about in history today, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, they were kind of on one side of this. And people like Frederick Douglass and Lucretia Mott, and, and there were many, many other lesser known uh, incredible activists whose names I am, don't have off the top of my head right now, people like Lucy Stone as well. Um, but, but anyway, so you had the people that sort of get the most talked about, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony on one side of this, and then other people on the, with the other organization. And early on, this split actually originated over a disagreement about whether or not to be more holistic in their approach. And so Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton actually had a donor for some of their work that was openly racist, but supported women's rights. And because they viewed women's rights as more important above all else, they wanted to accept this funding and work with this donor. And people like Frederick Douglass, an African-American man, basically said, no, it doesn't have to be one or the other. We can fight for both black liberation and women's suffrage and women's rights at the same time. But if we wanna do so, we can't use the support and money of an openly racist donor. And that's a split. It was actually a huge split in their movement that basically we don't learn about and doesn't get talked about or taught in history classes today. But to me, this really shows that this is not unique to veganism and animal rights, that there have been conflicts over how holistic to be, whose support to take, whether to focus on one issue or many issues. And it honestly just seems pretty human and natural and something that is just going to be there in any social justice movement that we are talking about. My intention is not to take a specific position right now on any group, AV or otherwise, other than to say, I think these are really complex issues and that one, we shouldn't sweep every concern under the rug with unity, but two, some of the claims around unity are more legitimate because I see so, I, I do and have seen so much infighting over language, over what honestly I consider to be more minute issues. But I just see this unity thing coming up again and again. Unity is important. So are discussing serious issues. And not all activism is equal, especially if our mission and end goals aren't the same. And having good altruistic, not narcissistic, exploitative leaders in our movement and organizations is also incredibly important. So I just want to encourage everyone to take a deeper critical look. Don't just dismiss concerns immediately with, you know, we need unity, don't criticize everything, all activism is good. And also maybe not take such a critical approach that you believe your form of activism is the one and only right way to do activism. And therefore you're going to criticize everything else out there. So yeah, do, do your own thinking, figure out what calls to you, what makes sense to you, what you feel is necessary to call out and criticize, and what you feel is maybe more important to, to just let it go and see the good in what is going on. I will uh, see you next week in a future video.